Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! A landmark report from the United Nations is warning humans are rapidly destroying the natural world. It is the largest study of its kind, and the United Nations panel of experts has found that up to a million animal and plant species are facing extinction over the coming decades, with 40% of amphibians under threat and a third of marine mammals. Well, the UN panel calls for urgent action to save the biodiversity of the planet on which humanity, humanity's survival depends. Our science correspondent, Rebecca Morell, reports. From the oceans to the land, from insects to exotic plants, life on Earth is declining at its fastest rate in millions of years. This is the stark conclusion of a major new UN report, which warns the planet is facing an ecological crisis. If life on Earth is in trouble, we are on trouble. Our future is at stake. There's really no human future without a future for the fabric of life that sustains us. The report details the destructive impact that humans are having on the environment. 75% of all the land on Earth has been severely altered by humans. 85% of wetlands have disappeared since the 18th century. They're now vanishing at a faster rate than forests. And plastic pollution has increased tenfold since the 1980s. The backdrop to this is that human population has doubled in the last 50 years, adding growing pressure to the natural world. And take a look at the bigger picture. Everything in nature plays a role, even the smallest creatures, like the narrow-headed ant in Devon. The insects keep the soil healthy, they break down organic matter, and they're also food themselves for birds and small mammals. But they're now on the brink of extinction. These tiny ants are the last of their kind. They used to be widespread, but this small patch of heathland is the only site left in England. All around them, their habitat has been destroyed, and it would just take for this last refuge to go, and this species would be lost forever. The UN says there are solutions, but we'll need a major rethink of how we use land, especially for agriculture. Deforestation will also have to end so the forests can grow again. And the pollution making our oceans uninhabitable cleaned up. But the report says our insatiable use of the planet's resources needs to stop now. We shouldn't waste our food. We should conserve our energy. We should conserve our water. So all of us, from the individual to the government and the private sector, we all have a role to play. And it's doable. We're not asking people to drastically change their lifestyle, but be more careful. The window of opportunity for nature's global rescue plan is small. The UN says if we fail to act, many species will be left fighting for survival. Rebecca Morell, BBC News, Paris. Now, wildlife and habitats across the world are declining at an unprecedented rate, putting up to a million species of plants and animals at risk of extinction. That's according to a major new report by scientists backed by the United Nations. It warns that our behaviour is posing a direct threat to economies, food security, health and human well-being. And they're calling for transformational change to stop the damage getting even worse. Anya Pop reports. Restoring wildlife in the city. At the London Wetland Centre, helping reconnect people with the natural world is at the heart of what they do. That's one way that you can identify them. Something more pressing than ever. Today, a damning report by UN scientists says nature is in more trouble now than at any other time in human history, with extinction looming over one million species of plants and animals. The damage is all down to humans, but the scientist behind the report says it's not too late to fix. It's a moral issue. We should not destroy nature. And it's an ethical issue because the loss of biodiversity hurts the poorest of people, further exacerbating an already inequitable world. Unless we act now to reduce the loss of biodiversity, we will undermine human well-being for current and future generations. South America, you know, Amazon's been depleted, um, Africa, lots of logging. Today's report didn't come as a shock to those working in conservation. 
What is biodiversity? Biodiversity is everything that's on this planet. It's, it's us, but it's every piece of wildlife, every insect, every bit of habitat, um, every plant, every tree. It's where it all fits together and it sort of makes a big circle and it all supports each other. And uh, we're part of the problem now because we're not supporting it. In fact, we're destroying it and that's not helping the planet. Ultimately, it won't help us and it won't help the wildlife that's on the planet. The report highlights we're not just damaging land habitat, but ocean life too. Marine plastic pollution has increased tenfold since 1980. It's causing great harm to over 80% of turtles, almost half of seabirds, and almost half of marine mammals such as whales and seals. We're really seeing people around the world waking up to the threat of plastic pollution and those other pressures that are facing marine life, but we're not seeing enough action right now. You know, governments are talking about the threats um, and that is one positive step, but that really needs to be followed with bold action. The environment has risen to the top of the political agenda. Just last week, Parliament declared a climate emergency. Today's evidence that we're heading towards an ecological disaster will only intensify the calls to reassess our relationship to the natural world and fast. Well, joining me now is Izzy Warren, a 15-year-old environmental activist, and Dillis Rowe, who's a biodiversity researcher at the International Institute for Environmental Development. Dillis Rowe, let's start with you first. Um, there have been repeated warnings of this kind of nature. How urgent would you say is the need for action now? It's really urgent and it's shocking that we've not taken action before now despite all the repeated warnings and it's particularly urgent for the poorest people in the poorest countries who will be most profoundly hit by the devastation of nature. So Izzy Warren, you feel fully justified in skipping school to, to mount your protests that you've been doing? Yeah, I think this is the greatest threat that humanity has ever faced. It's universal, it doesn't respect all of these human constructs like borders and money, it will happen regardless of whether we talk about it or not. All we can do now is put all of our efforts and resources into stopping it. it well, you, it's... you talk about effort and resources. We're talking about transformational change. That's what the, N the UN is demanding. What exactly does that mean, do this, Ray? That means far more radical change than we've seen to date. It means a thorough change in the way we do business, thinking about GDP in different ways. Specifically, it means changes by governments, financial institutions and the private sector in removing the subsidies and tax breaks that are there for harmful industries such as industrial agriculture, industrial fishing, fossil fuel production and replacing those with environmentally friendly incentives. When you talk as the UN has done about you know less of a focus on GDP growth that means really call a spade a spade that we're all going to be poorer doesn't it? It doesn't mean we're poor, it means redefining how we view our quality of life and not just basing it totally on material consumption but also thinking about other values that we get from nature and factoring those into our quality of life. Well, Izzy Wong, what do you say to that, that, you know, if we want to save the planet, really, we've got to be prepared to dig into our pockets. Would you be happy in the future when you grow up to be poorer because of I this? I don't think being sustainable is directly linked to being poorer. I think what we need to be doing is transitioning away from this belief that being, that being successful is this kind of idea of infinite economic growth. We need to be transitioning from this linear economy that is founded on the basis that we can just keep exploiting and exploiting and exploiting these infinite resources on what is ultimately a finite planet and instead transitioning to a more circular economy. So are you prepared yourself to sort of put your money where your mouth is and, you know, go on fewer holidays that involve big, long flights, use your car less, you know, eat less meat, because all the, these things we're s are supposed to sacrifice, aren't we? What do you think? I think those are perfectly reasonable sacrifices to make, because what's the alternative? If we don't make these sacrifices, and those are fairly small things to make, people are already dying because of climate change. There are meant to be 200 million climate refugees by 2030. These are... We can't ignore these facts. We can't ignore the fact that this will have an incredible impact on human life. So those are sacrifices that I think I believe, and I think most of my generation actually believe, are willing to make. And what do you... What kind of sacrifices do you make on a daily basis, would uh, you say? I'm vegan. I very rarely drive a car. I take public transport. I'm trying to go plastic-free and zero waste. Uh, and also, I speak about this stuff. I 
strike from school and that is a big sacrifice to make it's not something that any student does lightly we're not trying to skip school but it is what we feel the only way to get our voices heard because quite frankly petitions and protesting on weekends that hasn't done anything we've been doing that in the past and governments haven't listened no one's acknowledged us the only time we've gotten kind of news headlines the only time we've gotten actual recognition from politicians is when we put stuff on the line for them, and that is striking. Well, Dillisroy, that's the point, isn't it? I mean, Izzy Warren here is an incredibly powerful advocate, but are the politicians listening? They haven't been listening to date. As I said, we've heard endless warnings about the dire state of nature. The fact that they have begun to take more notice about climate change and the, declaring the climate emergency is a positive step forward. But they really do need to listen more. They need to listen to the younger generation, they also need to listen to indigenous peoples and local communities in poor countries that are managing their lands and their wildlife sustainably. But they need to go beyond listening. We need to actually take action now. Well, Izzy Warren, what action are you going to be taking next to try and make the adults and the politicians sit up and... We are action? continuing our strike on May 24th. Young people across the UK, across Europe, will be taken to the streets again to continue to demand climate justice. We want actual action on climate change. Declaring a climate emergency is great, but it's just words. It's sim entirely symbolic words. And while it does show that the government recognises the threat that we're facing, it doesn't say that they're actually going to do anything about it. We've heard so many words from them, and there's very little evidence to prove that they are actually listening. You're not so, going to let them off the hook on this one? Absolutely not. Izzy Warren, Dillis Rowe, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> well, welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me this evening, Harriet Sargent and Stig Abel. Welcome back to both of you. Um, let's get a really important story in the eye. The Another important also story. Leading on it, yes. Well, there's an irony to it, isn't there? We're talking about a new baby in the world, and yet, you know, the suggestion in, in these reports about the extinction threat over is overpopulation. Too many yeah. babies. So there's the uh, the eye planet in crisis. One million species at risk of extinction. Uh, and the question for all of us, I think, um, is. How many headlines like this, I mean, all of us, I mean, collectively, the human population with agency to do anything about it, um, how many times are we confronted by the fact that the gradual industrialisation of the world, the gradual agricultural revolution that's mm -hmm. taken place over the last couple of thousand years is leading us to a place where we are compromising the environment such that it will affect our ability to live in the medium term, let alone the long term. That seems to be more or less an established fact. We know that. Things that we have done collectively are ruining the environment that's going to have a catastrophic consequence for us. Are we willing collectively in terms of governmental action or individually in terms of a sense of personal responsibility to take steps where we say I could have another child, I could fly twice a year, I could eat meat but I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use single-use plastics, I'm going to take steps to try and stop this even if people might say well it's completely futile because India and China and, and countries and other parts of the world are still churning out lots of pollution. Are we collectively going to do it? It is really hard, isn't it? Because human beings have shown themselves to be eminently adaptable, but normally when they're gaining something, like a motor vehicle, yeah. we don't normally have to take things away from what we've become used to. And also the problem is that where this is... Uh, the, 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 we're facing two, two problems, one good and one bad, and one is... and the bad one is that population is increasing and the population in Africa is about to double. Um, but the other thing is that even in countries where the population isn't increasing, as in China, you've got a rising middle class, mm. which is a good thing in that everybody's getting more prosperous. But unfortunately, if everyone, and this is the sort of terrible fact we try to kind of tiptoe around, but if everyone has the same standard of living as an American, uh, this planet's just going to come to an end. Mm. We, we cannot have all of us living like sort of a middle American middle class person. So what are we going to do? And has there ever been in, in the history of human development where mankind has collectively said we can have the ability to do X, Y and Z, mm. but we are going to choose not to for a greater good? That feels like if that's what we're relying on, that part of human nature where we see these problems. And that's why I was kind of in the climate change uh, protests. At least I feel that they've shifted the conversation, mm. the conversation that would have been yes. had five years ago. You'd be debating science endlessly yeah. and pointlessly. Mm -hmm. I think we're kind of past that now. Yes, that's true. We, there's a we common are. sense position. Yeah. Things are, are screwed. Things are bad. I mean, yeah. it was before we were all saying, no, it's not true, it's not true. Well, tell that to the US president, though. Really. Well, indeed, and you, and, and you have the... I interviewed David Attenborough and I, mm. I said that mm. to him. And I said, are you depressed? And he kind of said, well, no, if we change things, things will happen. And maybe, I, you know, I said, would you talk to Trump? And he said, if Trump spoke to me. Yeah. But Trump has a cold, there's a cold snap in New York, and he thinks that's proof that climate change 
doesn't exist, and he's the one saying that. They're not in the Paris Accord. You know, uh, but the, ca the danger of that is, if you believe that the US isn't going to do anything, China's not going to do um, anything, therefore there's no need for um, us individually to do anything, that's the other paralysis that happens. Because if you believe that the problem is so big, your individual actions will not help. Yes. But I think <clears> we <throat> need to be a lot more honest about what is going to change everything. Mm -hmm. um, and this very interesting report also came out last week, which actually told you what every action does, how many tonnes of emissions it, it produces. And, you know, the fact that you avoid air travel, well, you're only sa saving 1.6 tonnes a year. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that third child, you're saving uh, 58 tonnes a year. So I think that's enlightening. I mean, I, I don't think many people know that. Well, should we and I think we immediately would start doing the well, right thing. Each small I mean, action really done millions of times over is multiple actions, isn't and it? And maybe so... we could also be taxed on emissions rather than taxed on other things. You know, if, 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 if emissions, if emissions yeah. is the most threatening mm. thing in the world, mm. you are allowed X amount of emissions yeah. per year, and every mm. time you go over it, that's when you're yeah. taxed. Yes. Just yes. very quickly, we, we've run out of time. We've already come up with ideas. <laughs>